Hello there and welcome to episode 78 of Right Where You're Sitting Now and um, joining me once again this week uh, back in his inf- infernal chair next to me is uh, Mr. Mark Satir. How are you doing sir? Excellent, thank you very much. Thank you for having me again. That's very, that's very, always a rewarding experience. Oh yes, yeah, so, uh, I mean just being around me is a rewarding experience many say. You know. I wouldn't go that far. Oh okay, fair enough, fair enough. Uh, yeah, so officially now i mean by the time you've listened to this actually i think because we're a few episodes we always record a few episodes behind so uh we're at, we're you know in the future for you now or in the past for you now i should say time um, travel yeah time, time travel as we record this we finally breached i don't know why it's just totemic to me now or something it's like a you know, it's a it's a milestone thing but we finally reached the thousand subscribers on youtube so i can shut up now and stop going on about that every episode but uh but if you haven't already, do subscribe to us on YouTube, uh, sitting now. Anyway, um, what are we talking about this week, Mr. Satir? Stoop not down into that darkly splendid world, wherein continue lie of faithless depth and Hades wrapped in gloom, because sitting now is inviting you along the benighted path to the infernal mask, no less. Yes, that's right. This week we are talking to Mr. Richard Gavin, author of The Benighted Path, uh, The Infernal Mask, and many uh, uh, fictional books, as well as, I believe, a third esoteric book as well. Um, He's also a former contributor to Starfire uh, magazine or journal, uh, which is uh, run by one of our former guests, Mr. Michael Staley. The esteemed. Steamed Michael, Michael Staley, yeah, exactly. And yeah, so uh, we're going to be talking to him today about the topics within his books, and I'm really excited to do so. So uh, let's go over to that now. Richard Gavin, thank you so much for coming on the show. Um, could you give us a brief biography of yourself, please? Absolutely. And thank you very much for the invitation. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, biography, basically, I am both a writer of supernatural horror fiction and esotericism in nonfiction, kind of uh, a darker philosophical, mystical vein. Um, I've had an interest in those areas, basically reaching all the way back to to childhood. I was always fascinated by them. Um, you know, beginning on a somewhat, I suppose, simplistic level in, in early childhood. And that eventually became more philosophical and sophisticated as, as the years went on. Um, I've authored six books of fiction and three books of esotericism. And the latest one is The Infernal Mask from Theon Publishing, which was just released at the beginning of the summer. Brilliant. Excellent. So how kind of um, in The Benighted Path, you talk about... Uh... Uh, an early esoteric experience involving a waxwork museum and i was wondering could you yes yeah that's uh um maybe that's a good one to open with because that kind of i imagine probably leads us into you know the rest of your career in some ways very much so yeah it was it was i was extremely young at the time and even even at that young age i already was deeply fascinated with anything to do with 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 monsters or or the devil or ghosts, anything that was along those lines just really was something that I gravitated toward naturally. And my parents had taken us to a basically like a touristy area. And there was a a waxworks there that was basically um, a haunted kind of waxworks with a lot of horror scenes and, and monsters. And it was it, you know, both was definitely frightening to me because I was so young and at the same time, it was intensely fascinating. I think just the idea of of the that kind of controlled environment where where everything was 
um, not only atmospheric, but, but was so um, uncertain, you know, you never knew when you were going to come around the corner. And even if it was just one of those really cheesy sort of jump scare type of uh, mechanics, it still had this immense impact on me. And that late that night, I remember I experienced a, what I, at this point in my life would definitely refer to as, as a form of, of, of ecstasy or, uh, you know, working with the subtle body in which I was able to leave my body and return to that wax work in, and it was almost, it was very much out of a, a kind of Kenneth Grant style of, uh, of setting where everything was, was intensely laden with meaning. And even though I didn't know what a lot of that meaning was at that time because it was just such a confusing experience to me it was very significant and and i think that was a real crystallizing moment for me to to when i came to understand that a lot of the images and um, the atmospheres that are inherent in a lot of supernatural fiction and fairy tales and and horror films they really do go to the core of a way of interacting with with this world and that there is, an, you know, um, they're intensely laden with significance. Um, and that was something that, of course, took me years to kind of appreciate and, uh, and unpack and work with. But it, it's amazing to me to look back at some of those early childhood experiences. And I know a lot of people have uh, perhaps not exactly similar, but they do. They can harken back to really early moments of almost uh, a Gnostic moment of an, of an awareness of a sense of, of this deeper reality that surrounds us. And for me, it was, it was definitely, um, that was one of the key points, um, along my path. And it, I'm grateful that I did have the experience. Yeah. Um, so w- w- you, you write horror novels. Um, did you write horror novels prior to writing esoteric novels or? Um, yeah, basically I did. I, I have always written, um, the, the esoteric writings, really the first ones that I did that, um, were submitted and, and reached a, a readership would have been through Starfire. Um, I've, and that was the journal of the, the Typhonian order edited by Michael Staley. And those were really the first, uh, forays into, uh, a published esotericism writing that I was, um, I suppose confident enough to, to present because one of the, one of the uh, things that I strive for with my writing is to convey something that is, uh, I hope a unique perspective on um, the initiatory path on, on spirituality in general. And so I try to reserve my writings to when I feel that I have something that perhaps would be a, a, a different vantage on on certain things rather than you know regurgitating what people have have read hundreds of times over you know dozens of authors for many years um and so starfire was really because the the typhonian current is so invested in and interested in what kenneth grant would call creative occultism um i was i was really able to explore a lot of the themes that uh, were continuing to develop, and those eventually became uh, books like *The Benighted Path* and *The Infernal Mask*. Mm, interesting. So, was there any kind of like tension for you, sort of? I, I assume as like as an established kind of fiction author, was there a kind of tension moving across to you know publishing under your name, publishing esoteric writing? That's a great question, and I think that raises a really interesting point. I I definitely had some. Uh, it gave me pause, let's say, because y- you really don't know um, how the reading public is going to perceive writings that come out that are essentially of a of a nonfiction that sort of express a conviction that runs a lot deeper than oh well these are these are stories this is fiction this is mere entertainment. So yeah, I definitely was concerned and and was really unsure of how my readers or just the general public that uh, was interested in that type of fiction was going to perceive a writer that was coming at it from, from this more um, metaphysical perspective, I guess you could say. Um, It was really gratifying to discover that not only did the esoteric work reach a lot of new readers who perhaps weren't as interested in the fiction or just, you know, weren't aware that I wrote fiction, but only discovered me through the, the nonfiction work. Um, and it also, I was 
very pleased to discover that a lot of readers of my fiction um, have sent me emails or I've met them at conferences and things like that. And they've been extremely forthcoming and saying that it, it really did articulate something that they, they were also sensing about their own life and about the world. And that in that sense, it sort of gave voice to something that they understood those impressions, they'd felt them themselves, but hadn't heard it articulated in that way. So in the end, it was actually really gratifying to see that, um, you know, while there's still obviously going to be more people who are attracted to to fiction, because it, it can basically just be taken at that entertainment level. Um, in the end, it worked out really well in that the the esotericism, by and large, has been been really well received by readers. And they're they're really beautiful books, aren't they? I mean, they've done a really great job publishing these. They're um, uh, Theon, isn't it? Is that David? That's David yeah. Beth's. Um, company. Indeed, it is. Yeah, and they they're they're fabulous. Their their entire catalog is they're always just so magnificently produced. And I was obviously really honored that they uh, wanted to to publish these works and you know, was thrilled with the, the end product because they're, they're beautifully done. They really do create a, an appropriate vessel for, for the text itself. So I think that that's a really key part um, with, with esoteric books and magical books and occult books is that when, when they are presented in, in this very uh, considered and artistic form, it, you really do get the sense that it, there's something almost talismanic about it, that it's really, um, it's, it's a rarefied form of, of book. So to, to have my own work presented in, in that way was, was obviously extremely, extremely gratifying. There seems to be a real movement of that recently. I mean, obviously Scarlet Imprint or another one I'm thinking of, um, where they kind of, perceive their books as kind of talismanic objects as well it seems to be a real it's a good trend it seems to be a good trend happening in the kind of occult sphere at the moment doesn't it yeah absolutely yeah i agree and yeah it's it's really it's a, it's great to see that um that this sort of tradition you know this kind of grimoire tradition um is is resurfacing using modern technology and and so we have all all of the benefit of you know being able to access these works um, and they're still being presented with this this kind of old world um, artistic and, and real craftsmanship to them. So, yeah, I agree. I think it's fantastic. I think that they are really worthy presentations that that do elevate the the work itself, that do elevate the writing. In my view, I think it just it it really does. You know, obviously, presentation won't be everything, but it really does underscore the the importance of that of the work that's being presented when it's when it's done in such uh, at a at such a high level yeah definitely so how do you i mean this is a question i always ask because it seems to be different whenever i ask the answer always seems to be different rather whenever i ask ask it which is uh, um how do you define the left-hand path oh well i'm <laughs> i'm glad you asked that it's it's interesting yes because that that term has has taken on you know various definitions um but i think that what i what i try to do with it uh when asked this this type of question is to really look at the key principles that have kind of informed this this current um and it does trace all the way back to its origins with the vama marg in in india um and i think that some of the qualities that inform the left-hand path would be a, a willingness to engage with energies, images, uh, environments that have a certain um, challenge and and almost threat. There's a real desire for radical transformation. I think more so the the temptations of you know what might loosely be called the the right hand path would be to sort of seek you know, beatitude and tranquility. And there's nothing wrong with those states in and of themselves. But I think that it's, it's crucial for people to be shocked out of their own sense of self, be shocked out of their own uh, certitudes. And I think that the left-hand path in, in general through its various phases has that. Also in the sense that there's a, a, a tremendous sense of um, almost sovereignty in that it is a, a willingness to to stand apart to to test oneself 
to stand apart, not only from one's dominant culture, but also test one's um, one's own morals, one's own values, to always be assessing them um, and never falling back on um, a sort of reflexive, conditioned view of the world, always, always testing, always pushing further, always understanding that this perennial mystery, as I call it in the infernal mask that informs all these various uh, magical, mystical and philosophical traditions is not a mystery to be solved. It is one that one engages with. And in, in my personal view, the more one gravitates towards that, which may unsettle them or that may um, eclipse their own certainties, the, the more vital their participation in that mystery will be, the, the, the nearer they are to, to the real. So that's, that's my sort of view on it. I, I, I tend to like to give it those sort of key principles as opposed to saying, well, this particular sodality is definitely closer than that one, because I think that there's, these core principles can be done in a variety of different spiritual paths um, because we can see it in all different, you know, in different cultures from India to the Aztecs to, you know, uh, 19th century English occultism. There's all kinds of different um, strands that have taken this this sort of um, approach to to the just the mystery of, of being and becoming. So that would be sort of my um, my own uh, definition of that path. And then uh, your definition, there, uh, Mr. Gavin. Yeah, you 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 referred in a number of ways to sort of being outside yourself, which brings us back to you use the word ecstasis, meaning mm-hmm. which is a Greek word meaning, which is where the word ecstasy comes from, and and being beside yourself. I don't know if they have it in your part of the world, but in the, this part of the world, we used to have this saying, "I'm beside myself with outrage or anger." Yes, and, absolutely, um, yep. and and uh, that sort of. You're, in the book, you seem to be talking about a, a visceral kind of um, uh, experience, but also in that in that little description of the left hand path, it's it's taken on a philosophical meaning as well. Yes, and I think that that's another key point that that you've you've raised there, which is that that visceral level, which is another you know important principle that that I should add to that, which is absolutely it. The left hand path is deeply involved in embodiment and and in the flesh and seeing seeing the body as as the expression of of the soul or of the psyche um, that are completely interconnected um, so it is less about a, a kind of transcendental idealism and more about that real that visceral engagement uh, with with the mystery while incarnate and and utilizing the body towards that as well yeah, I mean, Blake talks about the the soul being a portion of the, no, the body being part portion of the soul actually, to the other way round. Uh, but he, he, yes, and um, very much yeah, about the, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, it's interesting. I think I um, mean, in regards to like mysteries in in general, do you? I don't know. I've I've spotted like more and more as the years go by. There seems to be like a kind of cynicism towards mystery. Um, in the general populace, I mean, and uh, I mean, the example I always give is uh, David Lynch films. <laughs> um, right. Yeah. So people become very angry when they don't get a, a you know, an answer, a solution to something rather than sort of, you know, a lang- you know, wallow or swimming in the mystery almost as what I like to call it. You know, I, I love the mystery of David Lynch, for example. I, I find that's his his greatest sort of asset in a way. It's the fact that you don't you don't need answers you you kind of face the mystery and you you kind of experience the mystery and that's the the thing (laughs) if you know what i mean i i agree completely i agree wholeheartedly and i think that that sort of cynicism and disregard towards the mystery it, it i i find it very bizarre and and unhealthy it's it's odd to me that one would feel that they're like we'll use the example of a film for instance if if they if they come out of a film where it's not entirely explained or or given a a kind of beginning middle and very transparent type of linear narrative structure that they feel disappointed i find this really uh, uh, strange um i've had that uh, questions in different interviews about my own fiction where it's it's difficult for a lot of people because they don't like enigmatic endings they don't like when the structure is somewhat cryptic 
But for me, the, my own uh, approach with writing is to, is to really evoke uh, a sense of dreamlike or nightmare-like atmosphere that you can, you know, feel. And, and it's much like in a dream, you don't necessarily have a full intellectual comprehension of your environment or the actions in the dream, and yet you experience it. And to me, art in general, I think, is much nearer to that type of dream experience than it would be to the kind of rigorous logical experience. So I have no problem. I'm, I'm with you as well. I mean, I, I, I love the the enigma of a lot of David Lynch's films and a lot of films along those same lines. So to me, yes, I think that it's, it's not necessary in any way to have a, a full understanding. I think that that, that often really comes down to a kind of neurotic feel uh, that people have a need for control. You know, there's just a general sense. I feel that, that people, even if it's, even if it is a completely illusory, um, a kind of illusion of safety or an idea of control, uh, they, there are a lot of people that just would rather cling to that and don't want to deal with the possibility that perhaps certain things will never be explained, that they, they do not make sense, that some tragic things will be something that they have to endure in their life. And I think that um, horror fiction, horror films, and these types of, of uh, works of art are really important in that regard because they, they provide a context that gives people a, a, a pool of emotional comprehension of these types of experiences that they can then draw from when it, when they encounter it in real life. I think that that's really important because the, the more that we go along as we, you know, continue moving along in the 21st century, we, it's, it's disturbing to see how much more of the illusion, uh, people gravitate towards, you know, they will create, they'll live their lives through their social media accounts and they will, you know, there's, there's this virtual reality that people, you know, they cannot function without a screen, you know? And so I, I think that that's very detrimental. I think that it's, it's really important to remember, you know, where you are and engage with, with life in all of its phases, not just the, you know, the, the uh, joyful, phases but you know the things that are disur disturbing as well and the fact a big part of that is the understanding that you know you can do certain things that will give you a certain measure of control in your life but ultimately you're never going to have everything under control there is always going to be things that are going to slither out and cause you to realize that you're not at the center of everything and i think that's a a really important point that people tend to be all too willing to ignore or deliberately lose is that notion of not being in control at all times of not always having everything um, exactly as they want it. So I think that that's an important reminder that enigmatic art, disturbing art, you know, uh, frightful art, things of that nature are really great at shocking people back into that awareness. It's also um, that the multi faceted nature of the word mystery or the context it's used in i mean it's not in the same way it's not a mystery in the same way it's like a crossword puzzle or something you know it's, right. it's a mystery in the sort of classical you know it's in the classical sort of mystery school sense of the word you're you know you're immersing yourself in a in a, an experience it's not so i mean you can it's not even something you can necessarily articulate or you can go halfway maybe but it's not like a crossword puzzle or it's not like um like a murder mystery or something and i suppose yeah if absolutely you approach, yeah if you if you approached it with that kind of um the headset you'll think well something's being kept from me well it, it's it's being kept from from you you're being kept from yourself actually if you try to approach it like that it's an immersion in the mystery itself mystery becomes deeper it's more yes, profounder that's that's just it abs i i i concur and i think that you know, it's, it's, it's fascinating that, you know, you mentioned the, the mystery cults and the mystery tradition, a great deal of that when you look into this whole process and what it means to be immersed in something fully, it really does involve um, a kind of loss of self in the sense that one loses their compulsive grip on this egoic identity it's not that one dissolves one doesn't vanish one doesn't you know um 
dissolve and merge with any sort of greater um, something greater than than themselves in a physical sense. But what ends up happening is you're eclipsed and become completely seized by this ecstatic experience. And and this is not something that is strictly reserved for for metaphysics or for magic. I mean, you can see it in you know, in an erotic experience, in an artistic experience, there are moments when one loses oneself and becomes completely immersed in something that is, that runs deeper than that, that everyday awareness, than that, that sort of chattering egoic identity that, that is constantly trying to uh, compute and assign, assign measure and value and meaning and, all of that is when when that is let go of when that is emptied out uh which sometimes does happen in a kind of tidal wave when when one's in an experience especially when they're not expecting it to happen um what ends up happening is that kind of depth experience is that moment where they do engage with uh, a deeper level of reality and i think that that's yeah that's hugely important and that is i think integral to the whole concept of this perennial mystery is that as you said it is not like something along the lines of a crossword puzzle well well i'll just engage with it now but sooner or later i'll figure this out i'll get this under control and then once i solve this mystery i'm good i'm i'm a perfected being i don't have to worry about anything any longer and that's just you know that's simply not the case as 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 any adult knows yeah it's i i, I sort of going back to the kind of cynicism thing which kind of links into what you were just saying as well the um I think a lot of that comes down to I think people used to use religion as a way to kind of explain chaos, didn't they? And I, I, I think um, they didn't mm-hmm. need they didn't need to kind of engage with mysteries because it was already solved for them by the church or by you know by this kind of uh, uh, you know but but this doctrine. And um, now because everyone's become a lot more narcissistic, I suppose they're all using social media. They're using you know they're 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 reliant on that almost. This chaos is starting to creep back in. It's quite interesting to watch actually. I I, I use social media, but I don't use it as a crux like a lot of people do. You know, it's it's more of a tool to me, I suppose. So it's really sure. it's an interesting to see how people are dealing with dealing or not dealing in in, in a lot of cases with this kind of chaos with the absence of a kind of strong uh religious sort of uh you know uh, uh rule behind them sort of thing yeah absolutely i would agree and you know i think that the the, the interesting thing is is as with every invention every technology every technique there are of course excellent ways that you can use them you know i mean i i use social media as well we're sitting here talking now using 21st century technology to conduct this interview there's absolutely uh, nothing wrong with utilizing these things um but as as you have said it's it is when it becomes the next the next crutch the next you know the next thing to that they cling to so it's 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 all well and good to to approach a kind of you know, have this sort of nihilistic approach to the world or this, this jaded cynicism, but sooner or later, one begins to realize that they either have to take a very superficial approach to the world if they want to maintain that, or they have to begin to assess things a lot more deeply. Um, and I think that that's where these things come in, because as you said, it has been really interesting to see that, um, this this mystery and going back to what we were talking about at the beginning of the interview with the the talismanic publisher is still producing there's still this hunger for this there's still this absolute um fascination with these kinds of modes of interacting with the world and i don't think that that's ever going to change no, um i think and people... i think that that's that's fundamental to it I think people crave authenticity, don't they? It's like um, there's a philosopher I read a lot, Baudrillais, and he talks about kind of simulacra and simulation. But really, the kind of crux of it is people sort of searching for authentic experiences. And I do feel that the kind of recent rise in the occult that we've seen um, it, it might reflect people kind of looking for you know authenticity in their life. Maybe. Yeah, I would agree. I would I would absolutely agree with that. I think that you know that's that is really important because. At the end of the day, we do understand that, you know, image can be incredibly powerful, but only if it is connected to something that is is expressing that sort of deeper reality. So if it is, if it is just a sort of um, 
shimmering mirage, you know, the, the kind of thing that, that say an advertising firm would, would love to do where it pre- presents this sort of seductive, but ultimately hollow, um, mirage that's designed to sell products or sell basically sell an idea of happiness very quickly people run through and and see through that they can basically um see that it that for the facade that it is and yeah as you said at a certain point everyone will be seeking a more authentic type of experience and i think that that is absolutely where philosophy where where art where magic and mysticism all of these um traditions are there to to service that and to help one engage with this at, at that authentic level because you know it, it is such an important um quest that that people will undertake in their lives and and uh and not something I usually accuse myself of coming to defend religion a little bit here. There is, there's, there's a tradition within religion, a deeper tradition. You know, like um, the, the Saint John of the Cross's Dark Night of the Soul, and the spiritual exercises of Saint Ignatius, and the Interior Castle by um, Saint Teresa. There's, there, there's that kind of disciplined immersion into a much deeper. I mean, the Saint John of the Cross doesn't offer you easy answers, and there's so there is that tradition there as well. I mean, we've lost sight of it, or it was never part of the mainstream. It never could be, but um, there's there's a root of authenticity there as well. And I think another conflict of interest when it comes to mystery schools is the we were talking to this uh, talking to Long Milo to get about it recently in the modern age. You have, uh, you know, people uh, that we've got access to more information, but not understanding. So people can like read, well, I'll find out what the, what is this initiation ritual all about? Okay, well, I know it now. Well, no, you don't. It's like, it's like trying to say, well, what's it like to eat oysters or go for a swim? You can only know that from experience. Sure. That's yeah, ex- exactly. And that's, that's, and you raise an important point as well with the whole idea of, yes, there always being this sort of deeper core. Is there, is, is, there a superficiality or at least perhaps an emotive based level to uh, let's say organized religion yes of course but at its core i mean you read you know you mentioned you know saint teresa of avila you know you read her her visions and it's, and they're incredible visionary experiences uh it doesn't matter what particular tradition she w- she was um involved in it was basically a, a really profound level of visionary experience and I think, yeah, and I, I, I think as well, you know, that it's um, with that is is that is that understanding of one can find it provided one is willing to go beyond the, the sort of superficial level or the uh, doing things by rote or just accepting a particular uh, doctrine of faith because it provides emotional comfort. Uh, once one begins to explore it, anything really on a metaphysical level, anything that has any depth at all to its nature will begin to reveal those layers. Um, so I think that that's, yeah, that's a really important point. Yeah, definitely. Let's go back a bit. Um, obviously, if you're writing for Starfire, I, I assume you were um, interested in Kenneth Grant at some point. Um, we, oh, absolutely. We just had uh, Michael Staley on. What, what, what is your take on um, on Kenneth Grant and his, his work? Well, you know, Gr- Kenneth Grant was one of the, the really uh, thunderbolt moments in, in, in my life. I discovered him, oh, I guess I would have been 19 or 20, um, and I began reading his work. And it was so unlike anything that I had, I had encountered in even the field of occultism. And it was, it just seemed so densely packed with all sorts of everything from, um, you know, Advaita and then sort of non-dualism of, of Eastern traditions that, that Grant was interested in to Crowley, to, to Lovecraft. And there were a lot of aspects of, Grant's work that I felt a tremendous sense of personal resonance with, particularly um, because since childhood, I've been, for whatever reason, able, I've been a very prodigious dreamer. So dream was always um, a crucial part of my life. And when you read the Typhonian trilogies and you read especially his novels, such as Against the Light, you can really see that Grant 
not only saw the importance of of dreams and visions, but he was really able to to convey that sort of dream like a uh, dream, almost like a dream logic at certain points with his narratives. So, yeah, I was deeply interested in the in the Typhonian current uh, for several years. And was yeah happy to do the those those essays for Starfire, which were my um, sort of commentary, I suppose you could say, on on Grant's work overall, how I came to integrate it into my own spiritual practice, and to sort of highlight the importance because I I know that for a lot of people, uh, Kenneth Grant is a, a figure that is sort of falls in the ambit of of Crowley, which of course he does. He was part of of Crowley's life and 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 the whole history of of Thalema. but I think when you look at all of the other areas of occultism, where he uh, made comments and and explored, he you know he did tremendous uh, a tremendous amount to bring Austin Osmond Spare to you know the the greater public consciousness. He was definitely my first introduction to Spare, who became you know a, a real touchstone for me and remains so to this day. Um, yeah, his 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 views on Lovecraft, I think, were uh, you know a little bit silly to be honest. But I think in the end, what I think what he was ultimately trying to do was show that evocative forms of fiction, such as the you know the stories of Lovecraft, are excellent means of that can be used to have a, a, a genuine mystical or magical experience of the world. They they you know that there are aspects in Lovecraft and the other weird fiction writers that were definitely describing a more uh, demonic reality that surrounds us. And I would I would completely agree with him on that point. I think that while you can't look at the narratives as, you know, absolute fact or as a, a as a reportage of of actual real world events, nevertheless, they still speak to something that is profoundly true that I don't think you can find in other forms of uh, fiction to the same uh, level of intensity. And so that was, that was a tremendously important um, aspect for, for me as well. So, yeah, I think, you know, he's, he's a, an immensely important figure. He's um, his, his works are, are highly recommended. I, I know now that i uh, you know, apparently with Starfire doing the the reprints, it's great to see those books back in print. I know when I started reading them, they were extraordinarily scarce. I think Scoob had begun doing a couple of reprints, but at that time they were really hard to come by. So I think it's fantastic that Michael Staley, um, you know, who I very much like and very much respect, is, you know, doing doing all of this great work to ensure that these books are available for for people who are interested. So, yeah, I, you know, he will Kenneth Grant will always be uh, one of the major major figures in in my own life for sure. Absolutely, and uh, Mr. Gavin, I was I was struck in the inf- in the infernal mask. Uh, he gives something which approaches uh, uh, magical analysis of Poe with the uh, the fall of the House of Usher. I was quite struck by that. Oh, thank you. Yeah, and you know that's interesting that you mentioned that because. Um, it, it, that was such a perfect uh, story to illustrate the points that I was making in that chapter. But yeah, you're right. Until you mentioned that, I didn't see the the connection. But that absolutely shows, um, you know, the, the sort of shadow of of Grant on my own work because that was s- such a an eye opening moment for me when I was you know a young man reading these works and and seeing that these that these types of uh, stories can have absolute import and meaning. You know, provided again, one goes past the uh, literal uh, perception of them and goes into okay, what 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 are the underpinnings of this story? What subtextually may may they mean? Uh, what what do they say about my own life and my own path and the nature of the world? When one takes that approach, then a lot of these stories bloom and they really reveal a lot of the important principles that that one can draw upon for their own life. Yeah, I mean, there's an element in um, the fall of the House of Usher, the house itself. I mean, it it sort of d- suggested that the house and even the tarn and around the house is is alive. It's got some kind of uh, elemental life to it, and that and reading it, reading it 
recently, or re- returning to it recently. I mean, it struck me how similar that is to theories of the, like what we what was now called the stone tape theory. You know that mm. that uh, buildings where dramatic events or um, uh, uh, have sort of uh, witnessed dramatic events or places that witness dramatic events have somehow absorbed sponge like have somehow absorbed them in some way. Yes, yes, indeed, and, and I think with that, that's that approach to the world has always just been something that has f- felt completely innate to me. Is this sense of the world being a haunted house, you know, and and the doors to this haunted house are everywhere. I mean, it's it's laden with long history, and you know, this it it's just it accretes, and you know, if one goes into um, an ancient forest or to a ruin or to, a, you know, an, um, a castle or to any sort of, you know, any, any of these types of environments that are laden with that type of atmosphere, it's immediately always been to myself anyway. And I'm sure to many other people as well, a kind of liminal experience. You suddenly feel, um, that you are in a, a, a rarefied place that it's, it is, it's suggestive of, something much older and and much you know that that is imbued with a kind of of power to it a kind of a kind of in, invisible and yet extremely palpable energy that awakens that awakens you immediately it becomes again it becomes one of those experiences where you are immersed in it and lose yourself and yet um, become more 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 aware more alive it's the, it is that visceral experience so yeah i would agree that the, that whole notion of the stone tape theory when you look at it in in terms of um you know even if you want to remove it from um psychic investigations and things like that and just look at it in terms of how we are impacted by by localities that suggest um something ominous or or something that is imbued with a tremendous sense of history um it feels different than it would in in a modern city or in you know a suburb or or a place that's basically just been designed for let's say commerce those are going to have a, a, a markedly different effect on the psyche than these other types of environments that I, that i just described so yeah i think that that's that's a really important point that you raised there as well yeah, it's interesting. In the um, going back a little bit towards uh, talking about Kenneth Grant and Lovecraft, and one thing that really struck me in the Benighted Path was the, the my favorite part of the book actually was where you're talking about dreams and um, the kind of you know the power of of dreams and how that's like a almost a, a it's one of the most important parts of the path almost, isn't it? And but what, what the thing that struck me was Grant um, when he's talking about. Uh, H.P. Lovecraft. Lovecraft himself uh, drew from dreams as well, didn't he? I mean, uh, he did. Yes. I, 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 I actually, because I, I, I brought this up last time, and I actually forgot the uh, the quote, but I've actually got it this time. Um, uh, yeah. So he, when he, um, the idea of Nalafhotep, for example, came from a dream he had about a friend um, uh, give, handing him a letter that said, "Don't fail to see Nalafhotep if he comes to Providence. He is horrible, horrible beyond anything you can imagine, but wonderful." And it's just like this obviously this dream had this profound effect on him and you know uh i thought i'd just find could you talk a little bit about um the kind of dreams and the benighted path because I, I found that whole section really fascinating oh well, thank you very much i appreciate that yes uh, you know as i said it's it's always been a just a knack that i've had it's not anything that i i necessarily consciously cultivated at least not in the early years um but when when one looks at the dream experience from you know from especially from the kind of orientation that i present in in the two books one understands that it is as much of a vital and illuminating experience as anything that one experiences in waking life um there is an ancient and long-running tradition that runs through the ancient greeks the ancient romans you know it runs through various cultures that discusses not only the ability to um, discover portents or omens through dream, but also um, it is has been believed by many, and I, I would agree with this assessment, that it is a meeting place where the living can engage with the souls of the dead. 
So it really is a, a kind of crossroads of awareness where one is in this kind of liminal state. I, I have had, you know, many, many stories and images in it that have been inspired by dream. I've gotten, you know, what I believe to be instruction through dream. So if there's one thing that I, I do like to uh, encourage readers and, and people who, who are interested in this type of thing is to definitely pay attention to those dreams and not necessarily just as um, riddles that you've got to solve, but as actual experiences that are because they are vitally important. Um, so they've always been a, a tremendous um, and integral part of of my own life and my my, my the art that I, I create and and as well as the the spiritual path that I follow. Um, and, and you know, with mentioning Lovecraft, I I agree. I mean, his his dreams were extraordinary. If you can track it down, there's a uh, rare I think it's a fairly rare booklet that came out um, many years ago called H. P. Lovecraft's Dream Book. And it is a collection that was pulled from his many, many letters that he wrote um, to his various correspondents because Lovecraft, of course, was a, a prodigious letter writer. And this basically just documents his the dreams that he either recorded for himself or shared with other writers that he knew and their extraordinary visions. You know, just some of them you can recognize where he he pulled an image for a story or, um, you know, was you mentioned with Neil Arthotep. Um, and then there are others that that were just individual dreams that he had. So it's it's a great way to see that even though in life we know that Lovecraft was very much a, a materialist um, and a rationalist, he nevertheless had this deeply profound dream life and I, I think had a, a strong mystical bent at his core. Um, I don't know how comfortable he was with that because it did great so strongly against this this scientific rationalist materialist view that that he did see himself as as being one of the champions of but nevertheless i think it's it's undeniable you 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 cannot read his fiction and not feel that that sort of awe that he just manages to to evoke i mean there's there's just this level of you know incredible vastness to it and and that ancientness to it so yeah, he's he's a perfect example of someone that that was that that believed they were one thing and yet had this other aspect of their personality. And I think that that was that was definitely something that Grant talked about a lot when he wrote about Lovecraft was that, you know, I, I'm not I wouldn't go so far as to say that in any way Lovecraft was an occultist or an initiate or anything like that. But nevertheless, he definitely had this this these natural inclinations and this this very strong ability to have a visionary experience and then to also be able to convey that through prose mm. yeah he's definitely i mean i completely agree about um receiving communication through dream I, I i used to have these recurring sets of recurring dreams and they'd always lead to some kind of you know um some sort of transit they felt it felt like knowledge was being transmitted to me rather than you know coming from within my subconscious it was very strange mm -hmm. uh, and uh yeah no, so i completely related i mean that i was you know i've reread that bit of your book actually <laughs> several times oh, it, i appreciate it, that and i'm glad i'm really glad it struck a chord i think it's it's immensely important and i think one of the one of the points that you know you've just raised is that i i think is crucial too is for people to not get so um concerned with the framework or the paradigm of these kinds of experiences. So let's say, for instance, that someone could empirically prove that all of these dream experiences and everything that I've written about in these books was just a facet of my own individual subconscious. Well, that's fine. You know, that, that it, to me, I, I, I don't know how such a thing could be proven, but it's, it, to me, it does not negate any of the experience at all. I think that it's it's less about understanding or or uh, conceptualizing it. Let's put it that way. It's less it's less about conceptualizing it into a kind of certain um, cause and effect system, and more about having that openness, having that willingness to you know 
ex- accept and be embracing the fact that yes, you know, your dreams, as you mentioned, did provide you with this this level of knowledge or these insights that you probably would have not otherwise been able to have. That's their import, rather than you know whether or not it was one's own brain or something outside of the brain. Um, I tend to lean more towards the fact that I, I do not believe it does all just come from one's own self. I do believe that that there's a danger in, in becoming too reliant on that sort of um, individualized form simply because the ego loves that kind of thing, you know, the, and it's very easy to then place oneself at the center. Whereas if one stays open and receptive to these types of things, and understands that there is the possibility that it may not be them, that it may be some sort of uh, presence or energy that is external to them, that is, you know, allowing them this, that is granting them this, this type of experience or vision or knowledge, you know, that's, a, I, I feel a much more um, positive way to, to go about this. Yeah. It's interesting. I, I like a lot of the um, historical elements of it as well. You, you talk about um, the Mara, uh, in the book and i find mm-hmm. i find the mara really interesting could you talk could you talk to us about the mara yes definitely well you know it's it's interesting i mean living living here in in canada particularly in eastern canada there's actually a a tradition um that stretches back many years um but essentially the mara is the is a f- a female dream spirit that it, that really is lies at the root of the nightmare and it is a a feminine spirit and in the on the east coast of canada they refer to to her as the old hag and it actually is the term for where someone looks haggard because when someone would wake up after having nightmares they would have that look of being you know ridden by the hag so it ties into that sort of um lore of 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 witchcraft and of ecstasy this so i i think that these nightmarish visions that people sometimes have when one looks beyond the fact of a, of a mere let's say anxiety dream which is really just a, a kind of reordering of of their daily life when it goes into that deeper encounter with the mara this is where one has the the, the frightening and also revelatory often experience of engaging with that a reality that is that is deeper than they, they swim out into their into a depth that they had not previously swum out to. And I think that it's it's also very interesting to see that that one is is kind of ridden by the by the Mara or the or the old hag because it, again, it shows a form of almost possession. And I think that that's that's a really potent um, image and it's a it's a it's a a mode of providing a kind of folkloric, um, framework that that invokes and describes a real visceral experience. So I hope that does that that sort of um, delve into the Mara enough. Yeah, yeah, definitely. You know, I, I love the painting as well in the book. It's fantastic. The um, yeah, you have the the horse in the background and the Mara. Yes. Sat, sat, yeah, it's a fantastic. Absolutely, not the nightmare because that's where the word nightmare comes from, doesn't it? It's like uh, mm-hmm. right, you know, there's a famous painting, isn't there? Yeah, it's it's uh, in the Benita Park. Oh, yeah. Right. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, the Fuseli painting. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which I've seen in real life. I've had the pleasure. I've actually seen that in real life. Yeah. Yes. Oh, the, that's that's fantastic. Uh, with the uh, with the imp uh, sort of crouching on the breast of the uh, recumbent uh, woman. Yes. Yeah, and yeah. I know I, I I don't know if this is apocryphal or or actual, but I I, I had read once that Fuseli was so fascinated with um, the experience of the nightmare that he realized one night that he was having nightmares because he had consumed red meat for dinner and then would began to basically gorge on red meat every night to try and induce this nightmare state while he was painting that painting. So again, I have no idea whether that's true, but I find that that that's such a great anecdote because he was, and I guess, you know, obviously his friends were looking at him a little bit strangely wondering why he was doing this, but it's because he was so intensely in the throes of this kind of experience and wanted more of it. 
Yeah, Fuseli was a great explorer of those themes, wasn't he? he uh, you know, there's famous pictures of the witches in Macbeth and uh, yes, and things from the sort of Norse sagas and so on. And I believe actually he knew um, Mary uh, Rosen. Can't say her name now. <laughs> Wolf, the uh, the writer of uh, Frankenstein. What's that? Mary. Oh, Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley. Wolf. Yes, yes, yes. yes. He, he 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 knew her personally, so. I wonder if there was an exchange there. I'm sure there was. Yeah, possibly. Um, one thing that um, I found kind of interesting, you sort of touch on it in the uh, Benighted Path, but do you, do you think people kind of consciously choose to forget dreams because of the, um, you know, the, like one of the sort of themes of the Benighted Path is kind of engaging with um, the kind of the darkness or the... Mm-hmm. Uh, um, do you think that because people generally don't like to well or don't tend to do that that they they consciously choose to kind of forget dreams that they find kind of uncomfortable um and do you feel instead that we should face them i think at times people may consciously choose to do that um and i think as well dreams in general have just become so devalued in in modern times um most people of course will say well I, i don't dream which is patently untrue i mean neuroscience has proven that everyone dreams it's just that some people are not able to recall them the important thing is is to if this is something that one wishes to pursue is to like any other faculty it's something that has to be worked on you know it's something that has to be refined and and honed and that that takes time and effort to learn these types of dream skills um i do think it's extraordinarily important to you know, face and engage with these types of dreams. Because in my view, um, I believe that terror and the sacred are absolutely interwoven. They are completely connected. Um, I don't think that one is uh, a detriment to the other. I don't believe that one has to be overcome to reach the other. I think that they are always deeply connected and that's why for for myself i believe that these types of dreams are intensely powerful experiences that are absolutely of that spiritual experience or or that numinous experience so i think by by ignoring those or by simply saying well these are unpleasant i would i i just like to focus more on things that you know are 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 peaceful or that provide me with a a sense of serenity that is extremely detrimental and extremely unrealistic because you know as i said these will always manifest and there's there's a tremendous there's a potency to those types of dreams that you you know that cannot that one i think disregards um at their folly i think it's i think it is a, a tremendous mistake to do that because it it's it is really trying to um provide that type of experience of of this otherness of this this deeper less certain world that does provide transformation and i think that's that's that is the 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 core of it um so yes i think that it's very important for people to to pay attention to those dreams and to you know to engage with them and understand that perhaps it's not just a simply unpleasant experience that there is something there that is uh gnostic or 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 profound about them yeah and at the beginning of the not this century last century in 1901 you had freud's interpretation of dreams and he took a whole you know the anxiety around that was a sort of sexual anxiety but then sort of later jung sort of explored those in a quite a different way i think one re- from my own experience of working with dreams is that i think your your brain shifts gear while she got up when you get up and then yes. <laughs> you, you 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 go about daily things you know you, your daily routine your brain shifts gear and sometimes you get little flashes like you know something breaks the dream but if you write the dream down almost immediately well immediately as soon as you can even in the most basic form then you can like as you say mr gavin there um sort of um nurture that skill i mean funny enough before freud i mean nietzsche he actually himself suggested keeping a pen and paper next to his bed in order to catch um fleeting thoughts which uh which he had on waking so even he was uh you know he was tying into the whole thing that's right and that's just it and you know it's it's interesting too with with that whole notion um 
is that it's it's not an either or situation with with this. So and what I mean by that is because one has the let's say the logical uh, a logical faculty. Well, of course, you know, one has to engage with the world. One has to be able to provide, you know, food and shelter for oneself. But that does not mean that the the logical faculty should be the sole arbiter of their life. And where esotericism and 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 you know myth and fairy tales and all these types of uh, venues, what they provide is this deep need for for an irrational experience, for an ecstatic experience, for you know that that fuller demonic reality, this sort of, as I mentioned, the world being kind of haunted and, and old. There's a need for that within us that we all recognize and we respond to it. It's just, it it's, does not provide that, the kind of shimmering comfort that someone who just says, well, I'm, you know, I, I'm strictly, I, I strictly believe in what the five physical senses give me. And I, I don't have any time for anything else to do with philosophy or metaphysics. So I, I just believe that this is the way the world is. Well, I mean, you can believe that, but number one, that's also, that's really attempting to, to take something like, let's say science that it was not designed to do, you know, science is, is a, a brilliant tool to show you the how of things, you know, how things work, the, the laws of the physical universe, the processes that, you know, nature undergoes. Absolutely. But the, the meaningful level to your life, I don't think can be provided by that. I think that it has to be something that, that goes beyond just a simple intellectual comprehension of how things are working. You know, we, we do crave that sort of uh, deeper engagement, that, that visceral engagement, that kind of ecstatic experience. And I, I think that this is where these other um, paths are, that is why they're there and why they continue to flourish in this, in this day and age, because, yeah. you know, it, it's, it's really not um, choose one or choose the other. There's no reason why one cannot perfectly function in, in the world and, and maintain that sort of level of existence and yet still pursue these other, uh, these other paths. Yeah. I mean, one of the, um, one of the most, life-changing experience i've had as dream related because uh when i started my magical work i i started keeping a regular dream diary and um on i can't go into all the details but in a nutshell i dreamed that uh, i was introduced to people i've never met before in my life uh, just whilst i was out shopping and then 11 days later i had exactly the same experience and i knew i had to, and as soon as i came back home it, uh, the first thing i did is go to my dream diary and the event the the events were exactly the same in every detail so after that i, I could, my view on the world was sort of it was very different and i couldn't go back I couldn't. Sure, I, that, I couldn't yeah, go back. Absolutely, and yeah, that's, uh, a, that's a wonderful experience. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> and also, the uh, re relating to dream work very much so is the and you mentioned it in the Inferno Mask is the is scrying because the the scrying faculty and the nurturing that is a kind of waking dream. It's a sort of dreaming. Oh, for sure. Yes, it is. I, I would agree. It's it's definitely a a mode of sensing that is very akin to. Uh, dreams, you know, and, and the way that one perceives yeah, their environment in dreams and their self in dreams. So yes, there's definitely a kinship. I think they're both part of that kind of visionary faculty. Yeah. And you mentioned uh, you, you draw on the sort of Aztec traditions. You mentioned copal, which is, what is that? I wasn't sure exactly what yeah. copal yeah, was. Yeah. So it's copal is a form of resin that um, is actually quite, still quite widely available. Um, it can be burned on, on charcoal and it actually does date back to the Aztec scryers, as far as historians can can ascertain, uh, when they used obsidian. Um, yeah, and uh, Azcatlipoca was, of course, the Aztec god of of the smoking mirror. Yeah, and you also uh, you, you touch on this as well. Like a D had a a black mirror made from obsidian, and um, it's housed in the British Museum. And recently, they've done a, some spectrum analysis of it, and they've actually discovered it. it actually, is Aztec by origin, yeah, which I which, I did see that news story, yeah, which was yeah. which was really incredible to read. So yeah, that yeah. was that was. I was really stunned when when I read that, that I, news article. I was. I, I was in some. I've I've always thought there was a connection, but the idea that it literally 
it came from that. Um, exactly. Was, yeah, was, exactly. Was I mean, I always wondered if it was some sort of, you know, that the, the, the techniques were similar and that it was using the black glass. But yeah, I was, I was stunned in the best possible way when I read yeah. that, yes, they, that they, they basically run tests and essentially said that it was Aztec in origin. Yeah, intrig- really yeah, incredible. Yeah, intriguingly, it's housed in the British Museum and then and a couple of galleries on the same level, it's on the, it's on the ground level, is the Aztec section and they've got an aztec mirror there and it it looks uncannily similar well now we know why really yeah it's it's got it's only a couple of galleries away from the from the d's mirror so that's great yeah it's interesting so one of the kind of key influences of the of at least the benighted path is um kind of night consciousness which comes from was it ludwig clark um Mm -hmm. he's uh, an interesting character in himself isn't he Uh, um i know that david beff's quite influenced by him but he's also kind of come under fire recently because of, of his some of his other writings <laughs> um right <laughs> I, was, I was wondering um could you talk to that a little bit and it, um you know to ludwig clark and the kind of um the influence and maybe we should probably throw in a, a kind of disclaimer afterwards as well because there's some <laughs> there's some uh, <laughs> yes well <laughs> Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. So I would I confess I prior to when David Beth began discussing uh, Ludwig Klages in in some of his work, such as the book Voodoo Gnosis, I was not familiar with him. I I had never uh, seen his name anywhere or read his work. But basically, he Klages was part of the uh, Cosmic School in uh, Munich, and this would have been early early twentieth century, and he his it's obviously a complex topic, so I'll try to sort of distill it um, as succinctly as I can here. But basically, in in his view, there was there were two opposing forces at work. Uh, one of which was the soul, and the other was the the geist or spirit. But in this case, a, a good way to think about it might be the intellect. Um, so, in other words, he viewed that there was a, a, a kind of intrusive element that was almost driving a wedge in between the the living soul of an of a of a person and this deeper world and that one had to really overcome that to to have a a kind of ecstatic or dionysian uh, interaction with the world and he was a great believer in um image being an expression of uh, of the soul that the the physical body was an expression of the soul and so he had a lot of really fascinating things to say. I know that uh, part of the, I, I gather the controversy was that given the the era, uh, we're talking, you know, points when I think he was writing in the 1930s in Germany, um, I think people can probably read between the lines and ascertain that he probably made some statements that were uh, less than, you know, less than proper, less than, you know, were basically, uh, you know, anti-Semitic. Um, with that, I confess I don't know a great deal because there's been so little of him translated into English. Um, his the the philosophical writings that I have read or the mystical writings that I have read, which Theon has published, uh, really do show a, um, a rem- remarkable um, vision and and a remarkable um, a unique stance on on what it means to to have a meaningful life or a deeper life. So, um, yeah, it's, it is, it's, it is rather unfortunate that, uh, he, he clearly was, uh, not on the right side of history as people would say, as people would say, apparently from what I gather. Um, but I think that, you know, his, his, his mystical writings, his, his cosmogonic writings are definitely worth reading in and of themselves, because I think that they definitely reflect a, a, a pure, um ethos that that's uh resonant with certainly been resonant with me yeah it's interesting I, I hadn't like yourself i hadn't really heard a great deal in fact the first time i heard about him was seeing a lot of angry occultists on twitter uh um sort of uh <laughs> posthumously kind of cancelling him <laughs> and uh right, yeah right. And, um I, I was uh quite surprised but yeah it's, I, i've started to read a bit of um I, there's like a sample of the book that theon put out he's quite uh, it's, it's very interesting the stuff he writes but it's also quite dense isn't it it's quite it's uh, very dense yeah yeah, yeah so yeah definitely yeah it's kind of uh, i'll probably i mean it's it's one of those difficult um circles to square really isn't it when 
you know, uh, it's a bit like the, you know, separate the art from the artist a little bit. <laughs> it's kind of the way I kind of tend to look at it. It's, uh, you know, it's a bit like I always give the example of um, uh, Klaus Kinski. You know, I love uh, Herzog's films with Kinski in, but we found out not so long ago that Kinski was abusing his children growing up. And um, yeah, so it's kind of like, well, do I stop watching um you know uh, Fitzcarraldo because because of that or do I separate the art from the artist and appreciate you know the actual artwork rather than thinking about the person it's one of those difficult things isn't it it's uh... it is it's it's such a it's such a difficult issue I mean on one hand I understand the you know that um certain obviously like behaviors and certain views are are can definitely have you know can be flat out reprehensible at the same time, the flip side of that is it's I'm I'm very leery to just um, think that the greatest artists, the greatest thinkers, the greatest you know th- that they are also saints, basically you know that they that they basically are that they live these these perfectly moral lives. I mean, I've certainly you know there are authors and artists and and philosophers that I whose writings have been immensely important to me. But I can't say I would necessarily want to, you know, have had them for a roommate. You know, it's so it's it's definitely it's it's a really complex thing. I think the the danger in um, people who get too morally outraged and just sort of want to wipe the slate clean of all of these people is um, at a certain point, you know, you really do have to look at the work itself. And I know that's extraordinarily difficult for a lot of people to do. But at the same time, if it starts getting into uh, trying to have a, a, a sanitized, morally upstanding, uh, let's say, canon of work that is that is permitted to move forward into, say, the 22nd century, uh, well, that's that's uh, I'm not sure how much will be sustainable with that. You know, we don't we, we know that all kinds of people have flaws and there are obviously, you know, greater and lesser degrees of that. But. Um, I think at a certain point, it really does behoove people to try and try and look at the work and see how it impacts you personally, you know, perhaps even on a, on beyond politics, beyond uh, social constructs. Does it does it strike a chord? Does it in, does it in, invigorate and enrich your life in some way? Um, you know, provided we're not talking, obviously, about something that's that's pure hate speech or anything like that. But if you're looking at something that is that is. Um, that does have that really powerful effect on you. Um, there may be no reason for one to to beat themselves up or disregard or, or wipe the slate clean and then seek out someone that was more acceptable. You know, there's 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 nothing wrong with having that that resonant experience because it 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 was striking a chord with something within you. Yeah, and an ethical an ineffical code, no matter what, if it's sort of right leaning or left leaning or whatever leaning, which is too stifling, too stifling is not going to offer people the opportunity to grow and develop as people, as an individual. Absolutely, and uh, so it's it's not fulfilling in my view the th- part of the important function of a moral code or an ethical code or whatever you want to call it in the first place. I agree. Yeah, I completely agree. Yeah, let's uh, <clears throat> let's move on. There's um one term you used in your book that I found really interesting was sacred horror, um, mm-hmm. and I was wondering, could you uh, could you actually define? Because I've never actually heard of sacred horror before. I've heard of you know uh, uh, you know cosmic horror and etc. But I've never heard of sacred horror. I was wondering, could you uh, could you define that for us? Yeah, it, it actually it was a term that I coined to really refer to. Um, that sort of emotional visceral response of of dread or horror that that comes about when one has reached the limits of their own perceptual experience and they are now stepping into something that is new it's like their 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 concepts of self and world have been transgressed and they're now emerging into a, a new area of themselves a new facet of themselves so sacred horror really refers to the fact kind of what i was saying earlier about the fact that i do believe that the the numinous and the the horrific are intertwined deeply that these images and these motifs that appear um and these these environments that we encounter really do speak to 
that kind of deeper reality, what I call a demonic reality, wherein it's it's imbued with a depth that is beyond its mere appearance. So this so a concept of sacred horror is really embracing that emotion as again not something that one necessarily has to conquer or even revel in per se it is recognizing fear fear that one experiences in let's say a ritual context or something along those lines as a a hallmark um a kind of call to consciousness it's 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 recognizing the fact that you are now moving further along your path than you would have if you had stayed contained, if you had stayed in in that kind of way to placate yourself. So I think that that's why it's a really important experience, again, provided that one doesn't get too mired in it, but does understand that it is definitely a signifier of a transformation, of a deeper process, of of something becoming more or other than it was prior to that. Mm. Would you say that kind of one of the key philosophies of the two books is this idea of kind of engaging with with darkness, essentially? It's a kind of, uh, you know, not necessarily even malevolent darkness, but just engaging, like like you say, with like nightmares and kind of um, things that you find uncomfortable that kind of, would you, would you say that's kind of a key, you know, a key philosophy of the book that it's kind of, you, you can learn from that kind of engagement uh, rather than, trying to like like we were saying earlier that you just need to solve it or just need to you know um you know shed light upon it it's rather that you would kind of revel in in that kind of darkness would you say that was a a good, good definitely uh, yeah that, that's a that's a definite definitely fair assessment of of both works that's that's really been one of the uh, key themes of of all of my work really both fiction and non-fiction um, is really seeing the importance and the significance of of that. Um, the whole concept of darkness is is so vitally important because it's it's evocative. It 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 creates environments wherein discrete forms become obscured. And other and in other words, it, it really does stretch one's perceptions and that's such a vitally important uh, part of, of my work. And, you know, I, as I said um, a bit earlier that the idea of a kind of haunted world or um, of, en- of engaging with world and sort of seeing it as this, as this haunted place has always been how I have just been hardwired. I've just, I've gravitated towards this naturally and over many years and, and having, done you know many different types of of writing that explores this in different ways it seemed to me that there were other people that could appreciate this as well that could relate to it on some level and yeah i think it's it's really probably one of the core themes of my work would be reveling in that and and embracing that kind of darkness rather than simply um defaulting to a term like let's say in enlightenment or understanding those things there's nothing wrong with either one of those things or, or similar types of terminologies but the problem with them is that it immediately turns into a, a kind of goal a pursuit a a you know something almost linear whereas darkness veils that darkness basically takes the apparent and makes it obscure and therefore um, reveals a little bit or, or at least evokes a little bit of its, of its potential depth. And I think that having that kind of depth experience to me has always been much more important than a kind of uh, progressive, linear, uh, more goal oriented approach, which people tend to, um, look to with even, even things like initiation to me, initiation is less of that kind of linear, um, setting a goal than achieving the goal than setting the next goal it's it's far more about transforming oneself about testing oneself about you know um attempting to really seeing the fullness of of an experience and experiencing it um as deeply as possible and i think that horror by its by its nature and the imagery of it is much nearer to that because it does it has that paradoxical element which is so important there's a repulsion but also an attraction you know it's it's it has a it there you know one is 
compelled to one has commanded to look but also does not want to look and it's it's that paradox that i think is really an umbrella term that that can can describe so much of these kinds of pursuits and this this path in general which is that it is paradoxical and that that paradox is integral to it that it's you know again it's not something that has to be resolved one doesn't have to pry them loose it's understanding that all things carry a trace of their own opposite you know the thing that that seems most other to you is probably you know has some sort of connection with you um the thing that is frightening is also very alluring so it's it's when one sort of gets involved in that kind of dance and engages with it that is why those images are so important because they do they have that immediacy where the paradox is 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 felt most most viscerally mm. yeah definitely so uh, how if someone wanted to kind of engage on the benighted path like how would you what would your kind of advice be like what tools do you use you know that do you use like meditation or uh you know that that kind of thing like how what's what's your take on that you know what, how, if people ask you i mean you must get asked like you know uh, how do i engage with the you know the benighted path or how do i be you know begin this journey what tool should i use like, that kind of thing like practical nitty-gritty yeah yeah sure yeah i and i do i, I definitely do i think the one of the important parts is that um and this has really been verified by a lot of the feedback I've gotten from readers is that it strikes a chord in them when they read it, they, they recognize it. It's, it's less something that is, that is novel to them that they have to kind of, you know, really hunker down and analyze in order to understand. It seems to have this resonance. And with that is really just trusting one's own instincts. You know, for myself, I use a variety of trans, of trance techniques, um, I do work with spirits. Um, dream is hugely important to me. And so it's, I think that the, the most important um, step that one can take if one wants to begin this is to really orient themselves to not only, as we were saying, you know, as I was saying just a moment ago, the the kind of darker elements, but really just beginning to comprehend the fact that I am going to engage with this, with my own being in a kind of dialogue. This is going to be an, an, an active conversation and, you know, accepting that an image or a, a, a dream, an impression one has, if they want to do something as, as simple as lighting a single candle in a room and, you know, meditating for a few moments, these are all things that can be done to sort of turn down the volume on the the rational solar intellect and be, begin to allow that you know that nocturnal soul that night mind to begin to flourish and express itself so with that i mean it's it's that is probably the the most pragmatic um direct approach i could say was to really just to just the best way to begin is to begin and to understand that you know it's it is more about uh deed than it would be about theory. So whether that's finding, you know, hiking into a particular patch of woodland that you find evocative or going into a, a forlorn place or a cemetery or, you know, whatever it is that, that gives a person that sense of, of liminality and that sense of um, that rarefied, haunted place, that is the, the best advice that I could give them was to be, to, was to pursue that and to accept that their own intuitions, the imageries that come to them, um, the whatever they perceive as possibly being a significant uh, dream or transmission or, or something that they, um, ex, you know, a shadow that they, they see during their meditation session to build on that, you know, to perhaps not, to not ex expect it to fall into a kind of um, spectacle but that it is going to have this, especially in the beginning stages, this this subtle form that it's going to be a, a much more um, it's because it will take a while to orient oneself more fully to that. But once they do, then it it, it really begins to bloom. So I hope that answers that question. That's probably the, the most uh, direct way I could suggest for people. 
Yeah, definitely. Um, well, I mean, I could literally talk to you all day about this kind of stuff. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> so uh, that, that, you, that normally means that we're going to have to have you back on at some point soon. Um, but could you tell us, like, uh, do you have anything new coming up? Or I know you've only just released a book, but do you have any other any projects in the pipeline? Or I'm currently, yeah, I'm working on some new fiction um, that will hopefully be announced within the next year. Um, after that, there will probably be, I would suspect there's going to be at least one more book to kind of round out the Benighted Path and the Infernal Mask. So that'll be something uh, in the future as well. Okay, brilliant. Um, if people want to find you online and get in contact with you, what, what's the best way? Uh, my website is just richardgavin.net. And yeah, I always welcome readers to email me. There's a contact email on the website. And anytime that they want to reach out, I'm I'm accessible there. Brilliant. Thanks a lot. And thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thank oh, you. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's been a great conversation. Thank you both. And we are back. So what did you make of that interview, Mr. Satir? Oh, excellent. Um, uh, uh, excellent. Uh, very lucid, very measured, very thoughtful. And, uh, and an excellent uh, commentary on the book itself. Where they're, where they're, they're quite demanding books. They're, they they do they call a lot from the reader, which is all I, I I always appreciate that, and I think that's as it should be. And um, yeah, and beautifully crafted. They are. I don't just mean <laughs> the outer coverings. I mean they are you know poetic and beautifully mm. crafted works. So yeah, so yeah, you get the you get the physical beauty of the book, and then the uh, yeah, the, the, the sense of aesthetics in the words themselves. Yeah, yeah, I love any kind of work that deals with um, with dreams in in the way that he deals with it. You know, in this kind of uh, dreams as a mystical, um, you know, mystical experience rather than just a subconscious one. Yeah, our relationship with that that side of consciousness. I mean, that you know, we've gone from instinctual sort of creatures to the sort of modern age where you know the conscious and the unconscious are sort of being sort of disentangled and then and then we're weaving it back together again through psycho psychotherapy and, and occultism and and art and and all in infinitely various ways yeah it's a an endlessly fascinating topic anyway if you want to connect with us um we are sitting now uh, one word on most social media platforms if you want to find yeah, i always forget to say this if you're watching us on youtube and you want to find the actual podcast do search for right where you are sitting now um if you're searching on apple i keep forgetting to mention this as well um we obviously we did the show a while ago and we've come back so the old feed is on there so don't panic if you you know you find the feed and it's got a load of shows you don't recognize and uh because we used to do multiple shows along one feed because we were lazy um, but yeah, we're easily found by, you'll see the triangle, uh, I in the triangle logo um, uh, on the Apple feed. So, but yeah, do do uh, subscribe to us there as well. We're, you know, we're regularly putting these things out now, which is great. So yeah, um, I'm looking forward to next week and I will see you then. And uh, I'll see you next week, Mr. Satir. I look forward to it. Excellent. See you later. Thank <laughs> you.